to whoever may find this. I've been trapped in this hellish island for more than ten years now. I can't tell you what kept me going this long. In parallel to everything around me, my senses seem to have frozen in a numb state, yet my hope still burns. I am not a brainy man, nor am I instructed in any occultism or paranormality. I don't know what has been happening over the last years, but it's terrifying. I think it's some rip in time, if that makes any sense. Everything has stopped. It was a slow process, as if the trees and flowers were suddenly waving in slow motion. People were walking around sluggishly, some slithering like giant snakes, until their bodies came to complete cessation. It wasn't the gradual progression that kept haunting me, but the whole inevitability of it all. I watched Sharon, my wife, stand for about an hour until she simply froze in place, amidst random rubble on our minuscule living room. Her eyes stared, vacant, as if gazing into the endlessness, as if terrorized forever. I mostly pass out of exhaustion on our filthy couch these days. I couldn't bear seeing my wife's horrified expression every morning, so I resorted to covering her face with a white sheet. I was able to carry our daughter Catherine to her bed, moments before she came too rigid to even lift. She was only six. I mean, how could I not be able to hold my six-year-old daughter, you know? Annie attempts to leave this nightmarish hell were insignificant. The sea waves don't move. At this point, I can believe my mind is slipping into insanity. But Annie's efforts towards boating away from this place is worthless. Boats are useless, and the only plane available crashed a few years ago causing a massive disaster. I've tried telephones, but the lines are dead. There's only a constant paused beep, as if every call I make is immediately paused. As the sole survivor of this tragedy, I can't comprehend. I've been alone for eight years now. I'm telling you about hope because I don't believe they're dead. They're just suspended. I have faith, but it's been more than eight brutal years. While they remained beautiful and young, I've struggled to survive and I've grown tired. My body is exhausted and my mind shattered. But I know God didn't forget about me. My feet are getting heavier, heftier. My legs are bulkier and I'm losing control over my own motions. I'm not shedding any tears, like I shed when Sharon crystallized. I'm smiling of joy. I've uncovered her face, and she looks as gorgeous as ever. Oh God, it actually feels like reaching paradise. My body is so stiff, so wooden now. I'm struggling to hold onto this pen. As I'm seconds away from finally meeting my beloved family in this perpetual suspension, I glance to my side, and as my body stiffens completely, my wife blinks. No one had any idea of what had occurred when flight UA-672 vanished. Radar had shown that the 727 had come to a halt at 33,000 feet and shot up to the sky at impossible speeds just mere seconds later. Radio communications were normal until the last 10 seconds, with the pilot's normal chatter being replaced by immediate dead silence. Everyone tried to dismiss the whole thing as an uncanny fluke. A fault in equipment seemed to be everyone's best guess. 
That was until the reports started flooding in. Planes everywhere in the world had disappeared in an identical manner. Space stations and satellites simultaneously share the same fate. Naturally, air traffic across the globe was grounded immediately. It didn't take long before the world's governments, scientists and researchers were frantically experimenting and trying to find a solution to what the anomaly could possibly be. Everything from drones, weather balloons, hell, even unmanned rockets were sent up. All were similarly plucked from the sky. No one could figure out the cause of the skyward abnormality. But their observations over a month of careful study had only concluded one thing. Every day, the anomaly would trigger at a lower altitude from the previous day. And it wasn't stopping. The peats, as we called them, would experience their crime on a continuous loop until we, the processors, who monitored their emotional state, felt that they felt true regret, remorse and disgust with their actions. Sometimes it took a while, but they all got there. Even the ones that cherished the memory of their crime eventually would come to hate the repetition of it of seeing themselves committed over and over again. The experience relived hundreds of thousands, millions, even billions of times was an existential water torture. And everyone breaks eventually and totally. The prisoners, deep in their induced comas and experiencing their own subjective time, could cycle through the events hundreds of thousands of times a day we'd monitor their brain activity remotely. An oddly beautiful time-lapse of their brain's chemical and electrical activity. A personal storm of passion and horror. Dark clouds of emotions twisting, turning and crackling with lightning and electricity. When we saw what we wanted, we'd bring them back. They were all different people upon their return with ancient eyes in unlined faces. Broken men and women, haunted by their actions. Reliving it still, in a sense. Some having spent a subjective lifetime trapped in a continuous loop, repeating an event they had initially committed, now swept along as an unwilling passenger, forced to experience it again and again and again. It was strange for me, to look into their haunted and horrified eyes. I'd been in their heads, seen the inner workings of their minds, studied the subtle play of their emotions and memories churning along with their synapses. Now I was on the outside again, forced to communicate with them on this basic level and limited bandwidth, exhaling sounds at each other, flapping lips, teeth and tongues. Us processors are a strange breed, and we get stranger over time. This subject was no different from the rest. Upon awaking from the induced coma, he burst into tears, sobbing uncontrollably, racked with pure and profoundly heartfelt horror at what he had done, and desperate relief to no longer be experiencing it. An assault ending in a homicide. I watched the simpler and less beautiful storm of emotions, micro-expressions and moisture play across his face, listened to his sobs and expressions of sincere regret for what he had done, and his relief that his torture had ended. But it's not over, I replied. You relived your crime 718 million 487,321 times before you showed true regret, disgust and horror at your actions. Now it's time for the second half of your sentence. 
you're going to experience the crime the same number of times from the perspective of your victim. I watched his eyes widen in dawning comprehension and horror as I reached for the switch that would put him back under. And then, with the flick of a finger, I once again summoned the storm. When I approach you in the park, you look pretty down and out. Clothes dishevelled, eyes bloodshot, nose running. The holidays can be hard on people. I sit next to you on the bench, the smell of your binge drinking invading my nostrils. How are you doing, friend? I ask gently. Not so good, you reply. I got fired from my job. Can you believe that? Fired so close to Christmas. My girlfriend keeps saying we're going to get evicted if I don't find something soon. Doesn't she think I know that? I reached out to my friends, but none of them will help me because I've asked so many times before. You know, sometimes I think everyone would be better off if I was never born. You look shocked as if you can't believe you've unloaded so much on a total stranger. I'm familiar with this effect I have on people. Now I'm sure that's not true, I say. Listen, you might not believe this, but I'm an angel sent from heaven to watch over people like you. Why don't I show you what it would be like if you were never born? Then you can see how much everyone needs you. You sniffle. Okay. I produce a tiny bell from my pocket and ring it. Suddenly, we're in front of a magnificent mansion. Where are we? You ask. I took you to your girlfriend. Let's see how sad she is without you. We peek in the window at the impressive interior with expensive furnishings. Your girlfriend is at the dinner table with an exceedingly handsome man, holding his hand. She laughs at something he says and strokes the hair of a beautiful child sitting next to her. But she's better off without me, you exclaim, horrified. Oh, I'm sorry, I say. Let's try someone else. I ring my bell and we're at your parents' house. A young man who bears a resemblance to you walks outside. Is that my brother? But it can't be. He died years ago. If I had to guess, I offer, he may be alive because you weren't around to influence him to drive so fast. I watch your face as your parents come out of the house, smiling and hugging your brother in a way they never hugged you. Oh God, you say. Take me back, please. I can't stand another second here. I ring the bell, and we're back in a world that you know is worse because of your existence. You run away and I wonder how you're going to do it. Pills? A gun? Or maybe jumping off a tall bridge? I know you won't be able to live with what I've shown you. No one has ever been able to. None of it was real, of course. But you think it is. And that's enough. I remove my hat to give my horns some air and keep walking, looking for the next poor depressed soul during this fine holiday season. <laughs>